Hello everybody and welcome to the Zero Project Impact Transfer um, uh, uh, workshop uh, this morning. I hope that you have had uh, very interesting first impressions out of our conference. Uh, I really want to welcome uh, you all uh, to come here to the forum. Uh, and uh, today you will be inspired by 11 amazing social entrepreneurs presenting their social innovations. Uh, and listen, they are fit for scaling up for internationalization. And I want to introduce uh, Leuk uh, van Kuitzen uh, from uh, Ashoka, our strategic partner who has been coordinating the Zero Project Impact Transfer uh, program. And he will chair the forum. And now, uh, Loic, it's in your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Loic van Kutsem, and I work for Ashoka, which is a global and the largest community supporting and promoting social entrepreneurship um, all over the world. And um, I have the privilege to be coordinating the Zero Project Impact Transfer Program, which is a collaboration between the Zero Project and Ashoka, where we indeed help each year 11 innovations to clarify their replication strategy and to offer or to present their offer to you today and seek for support or potentially see how you can replicate these solutions in your local context. Um, so how is the session going to be organized? Do you hear me like this? Yes. Sorry, okay. Um, we'll have basically three parts. We'll start with a panel discussion and I'll introduce our distinguished panelists in a minute um, as a framing and a bit of an introduction on what this program is about. And we'll hear also some testimonials from previous participant and, and, and mentor. And uh, we'll close the panel as well uh, and, and have Hector Minto, who, who so kindly joined us. Hector is in charge, uh, is working uh, in, at Microsoft um, and, and, and promoting the inclusion agenda uh, within Microsoft and beyond. Um, and, and he will be um, intervening as well in the panel. So first part, panel. Um, second part, will be uh, our 11 innovations will be pitching, will be presenting in four minutes each. So in a row, um, um, I will interrupt them every now and then and you'll understand why in a minute because the third part is you. Um, this is a workshop. We really expect you to not only actively listen to their pitches but also hopefully to identify ways you can support them. And for this, you should all have in your bag that you received this morning and on your desk in front of you, a so-called engagement card. We are inviting you to fill in these cards. Each card can be used on one, on one side. You can choose the initiative that you would potentially like to support. Uh, and on the other side, there, you can choose which way you believe you could potentially be supporting them. And there are different roles you can play, um, providing expertise, um, providing being a local implementer, so perhaps replicating the full model or parts of their model into your local context. You can provide connections, network, access to local stakeholders' contacts. Um, some of you might be able to provide funding. Others might be able to disseminate these innovations and help them gain more awareness. So there are a lot of different roles that all of us can probably play uh, to support the replication of these innovations. Um, and we will, I will pause twice throughout the 11 pitches and allow you to take a bit of time to reflect on how you could potentially support them. Before we get started with the panel, may I just maybe ask you, um, how, who in the room is, is interested in best practices? Just maybe give me a quick, a quick sign. Right, okay, great. Who? also believes that replicating or scaling proven solutions uh, in some cases might be more efficient than reinventing the wheel. Great, 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 great. And who believes that collaboration is key for a barrier-free world? Fantastic, great. Okay, so I hope you all at least raised your hand once. If so, you're in the right room. If not, you're still in the right room. Please stay as well. Um, good. Good. 
just one last thing on the modality. So these engagement cards, um, you can hand them over. We have during the three days of the conference at the entrance of M1, in front of the entrance of M1, uh, a desk, an info desk, an impact transfer desk where you can connect further uh, with these solutions, but also drop your, your business cards or your engagement cards or just give them to us after the forum as well. Great. So we'll start with our, our panel. Um, and I'll kick off the panel um, with you, Martin, um, thanks to whom we're all here today. I think Martin does no longer needs to be introduced. Um, and Georg Schön, um, who's the director of Ashoka here, here in Austria. Um, and my question, my first question to both of you would be, so Impact Tran Zero Project Impact Transfer is a joint program between Zero Project and Ashoka. Um, this is the second year that we've been doing this program. Um, what brought you together um, and why are you doing this, Martin? Uh, for, many, for many years now, the Zero Project has been uh, showcasing innovations, you certainly know, in the field of disability to you, our global uh, community of supporters. And with our new initiative, Zero Project Impact Transfer, our partner Ashoka and our pro bono mentors, uh, we now go one step further. At first, we want to enable the Zero Project innovators to transfer the most impactful innovations to new places. Second, Zero Project is the ideal platform to transfer social innovations with its global community of supporters, experts, its massive outreach of hundreds of social innovations in the field of disabilities uh, and the conference itself. And third, the Zero Project uh, report, there is a dedicated selection of this program, including some stories on the replication of our participants uh, from last year. Thank you, Martin. Georg, Georg Schön, what is your, your answer to that question, the why? Why are we doing this? Thank you, Loic. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, our answer is very easy. Um, we started the Zero Project Impact Transfer Project and program because we really believe in the power of social innovators. We believe that there is nothing more powerful than a new idea in the hands of a social entrepreneur or in the hands of change makers like you. And as you just confirmed, we also believed that we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time, again and again. The Zero Project demonstrates that it's all there. The solutions are here. Um, so that's, that is the dream, actually. That's the dream that unites us, that together we can scale up what works, that together with you we can take great solutions, impactful solutions for a barrier-free world to new places where they really matter. Um, and um, that is why we joined forces with the ESSEL Foundation, and that is why we want to join forces with all of you. Thank you, Georg. Another follow-up question to you. Um, what does impact transfer <coughs> mean, and how does this program enable the transfer of impact? OK, yes. Um, what are we actually doing? Um, out of all the uh, nominations for the Zero Project Conference, and that are really many, you know that, um, we select the solutions that have a proven impact model and that have the potential to go international, to scale international. Uh, in the past six months, we have supported 11 of those initiatives that we selected through online trainings, through individual mentoring, through matchmaking, and through a special camp that we just did um, before the conference here in Vienna. And as a result, the initiatives and solutions that you hear in a minute uh, developed and fine-tuned their scaling strategy and are now ready to work with you to replicate their solutions. And for me personally, most important is that we build a strong community of trust and of peer-to-peer -peer collaboration. And I really wish that many of you will join the Zero Project Impact Transfer Program in the future um, and that we together evolve that community. Thank you, Georg Martin. Would you like to compliment that? Yes. Uh, 
there are some adds to this. Uh, I think we need uh, the power of the global zero project network to increase the impact. Uh, it contains uh, of innovators working in seven different fields with the same goals to dear down barriers to persons with disabilities with their specific strengths. And what are these uh, seven groups of the Zero Project Network? This is, uh, at one, one hand, the social entrepreneurs. It's the business community and foundations. It's public administration, politicians, parliamentarians, the UN and its other organizations, the NGOs, nonprofit organizations, service providers and self representatives, academics, and media and social media. And with Zero Project, uh, Impact Transfer, we provide the business community and founders with the opportunity to become supporters of some of the most innovative and impactful innovations in the field of disability and accessibility. And today you can contribute to scale the impact of these innovations as a local implementer, as a founder, or a connector. Thank you, Martin. Let's hear now from Valboga Fröhlich. Um, Valboga is the co-founder of Atempo Capito, a social enterprise and social franchise model um, uh, active in the field of disability in several countries here in the region, among others on easy language. Um, and Valboga participated in, in this similar program last year. Um, Valboga, what was your experience um, participating last year and contributing again this year and sharing your learnings? So I have to say, you know, I have to say it was a big surprise for us when we were selected for this impact transfer program. Because from our point of view, it was just a project. A project which we invented to make daily news accessible and comprehensible for people with learning difficulties and disabilities. To give them the chance, the possibility to make informed decisions, to feel orientated and to know what's going on around them. On that time, when we were selected, we had about 30,000 users for our daily news service in this easy, comprehensible style. But within the impact transfer models and our mentor, we learned to think big. And we started a scaling up strategy. We did this with the daring goal to reach 200,000 people as users at the end of 2018. So, end of 2018 has been. And, uh, but we reached one million users. Five times more. It was uh, the program. Five times more than boldly conceived. And in addition, we found an awesome partner for the project transfer to Brazil, Claudia and Pedro from Escola de Gente. So um, I can report up to now, it has really been a success story. But the next tricky step is waiting. It will be to create the basis in Rio de Janeiro with our partners. And I'm, I'm sure this step is tricky because localization in Brazil is quite challenging for us guys coming from Little Austria. So every support will help us. At least we will ask you for fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you, Valboga. All the best with that new journey. Doris, Doris Rothauer is the founder of Bureau Food Transfer and also a very strong supporter of Ashoka since years. Doris has been mentoring a project last year, which was actually the Museum um, of Modern Art. Um, so MoMA was your mentee last year. And Doris is mentoring again one of the 11 projects this year called Danceability that you will discover soon. Um, Doris, what was your experience and what motivated you to join again as mentor, uh, providing free time to, to these projects? Thank you, Loic, for the introduction. Uh, well, generally what motivates me most is uh, when I can uh, contribute my little part 
to a more um, equal and um, inclusive world. And in this case, in my case, this is uh, supporting change makers with my consulting expertise. So working as a pro bono mentor for the impact transfer program is the perfect opportunity for that. And my experience from last year was re really extremely fulfilling in that sense, because it's not only about giving, uh, it's much more about receiving and about learning uh, from each other. So what I received and learned is partly due to the whole setup uh, of the process, which we heard already, it's uh, webinars, it's being equipped and provided with, with the uh, tools and methods how to scale uh, programs. Uh, the other thing where you learn is this collective exper uh, expertise from all the participants. So it's co-learning and learning from each other. And the third thing I received was this incredible um, passion and engagement that every participant brought into the process. And uh, comparing last year to this year, I think it even evolved into another level uh, because due to the evaluation that was made uh, by the Ashoka team and the ESSEL team, the professional setup developed uh, to another level. It's really highly, highly professional. And also the, everyone who participated in the preparation camp for the last two days uh, will agree, I think, it boosted the energy and the love and the passion of everyone to learn from each other and to collaborate and to support each other. And that is an amazing experience for me, which I would not want to not have. <laughs> and maybe at the end, a short success story from last year. Uh, as Loic mentioned, mentioned already, my mentees uh, was the team of the educational department of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. They have over 20 years built up a highly impactful access programs, a bright range of activities of access programs, uh, and through the scaling strategy that we worked on, they are now, um, they will now transfer their expertise in building an accessible museum to Austria, to Vienna. Uh, they will support the Albertina, which one of, is one of the most pre prestigious museums in Vienna, who also received uh, as a donation, the Essel collection, and for the pre presentation of this, we will create together with the MoMA the first highly accessible museum in Austria. Fantastic, great. So that's precisely the kind of impact that this, this program is trying to, trying to achieve, not only in Austria, but, uh, but everywhere where these solutions can be relevant. Um, before we close the panel with you, Martin, I'd like to join Hector Minto from, from Microsoft. Um, we had just a quick story last year in a similar setup, a three-day conference. Um, we had a fantastic experience. Friday afternoon, everyone was getting tired, you know, low energy, people starting to leave. and then. Martin, probably with his extreme charisma and, and energy, managed to convince not only Hector Minto from Microsoft, but also his peer from Google, to be caught during an hour, an hour and a half actually, with us and the 10 projects last year in a room. Um, and so it was, it was a very interesting experience. Hector provided a lot of feedback to the different projects, and it was just also fantastic, and maybe things that only happen in such contexts like these to see both Microsoft and Google in the same room, uh, collaborating very openly and sharing their, their advice. So thank you, Hector, for joining us again. Yeah, pleasure. Um, and maybe you can share your, sure. yeah. your work and perspective. I mean, I, I remember it fondly as well. I'd just like to say that. Uh, it actually takes me back to my roots. I, I spent 20 years working for startups in the assistive technology field. Uh, and the reason I joined Microsoft two years ago was for the first time in my career, I really believed that assistive technology was going global. You know, I really think that Microsoft and Google, and you know, I mean, it was an incredibly friendly session last year. Uh, but you know, if we take this inspiration of inclusive design and the amazing ideas that the disability community has always led with, you know, some of the technology we take for granted started in disability. Word prediction, emojis, touchscreens, that all came from 
people with, with disabilities or people working with disabilities getting inspired to, to problem solve. So, so as we go global uh, with, with our mission on inclusive design, on accessibility, I mean, I wasn't following Jenny last year, I have to say, I feel a, I feel, I feel a fraud now when I, when I follow Jenny. Um, but but we, have a, we have an opportunity to link you with Microsoft Offices, Microsoft Hack Project, the Microsoft Startups Program, the AI for Accessibility Program. You know, we're ambitious that artificial intelligence is going to have an impact on the lives of people with disabilities, but we need you to have the skills in AI, to understand AI, to understand how it impacts people with disabilities and, and start involving that in your processes. So everything that I can do to be that networker and create links between you and our offices and our, you know, our, our, our young in careers, our, uh, our, our, our interns, and maybe getting people with disabilities onto our intern programs at Microsoft offices around the world. Around the world. Uh, anything I can do, I'm here to help. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much, Hector. Thank you for being with us. Um, Martin, last question for the panel. What is your vision for the future when it comes to this, this program after two editions now? Yeah, thank you, Loic. Uh, our target is to expand the impact of the program by adding three components. At first, we want to engage replication partners. We want to open the program and trainings to established organizations that can help replicate these solutions. An opportunity is uh, to learn about, uh, more about the scaling and uh, starting exploring collaborations with the selected projects. Secondly, we need more capacity. We want to find more consultants and mentors able to support these projects in the implementation uh, phase and this is all pro bono. Thirdly, we are looking for funding to pilot replication projects. We want to mobilize people willing to provide money to help these solutions initiate replication projects with local partners. I will start this and will provide 25,000 euros each year on one or two projects willing to replicate in Austria. And I hope, of course, that I'm, and I'm convinced to find more funders uh, and foundations interested in doing so. If you are interested in, please let me know. We can talk together at the conference or afterwards. And I also want to invite you, as I mentioned it in my opening speech, uh, we will have tomorrow uh, in the afternoon uh, the possibility for all uh, potential uh, founders and, uh, and, and business uh, from the business world, uh, guys who will uh, follow uh, our path and help these beautiful innovators uh, you will uh, learn now uh, more about them uh, to replicate these innovations. But next year we will have another uh, impact transfer uh, project and all the innovations will come from the educational part. And the following years it will be um, uh, employment and the year after it will be accessibility. And our goal, of course, is also to develop an alumni uh, organization so that the existing uh, impact transfer fellows, uh, together with the previous impact fellows, will learn from each other so that we be really strong within the next 10 years. And if uh, it's possible and you help us in what field ever uh, you can do it, please do. We need more, we need more uh, hands uh, for this uh, supporting, uh, and I wish you, uh, the 11 uh, Impact Transfer Fellows, uh, the very best for your presentation. And I just want also to say thank you so much to the mentors. Some of them are here. It's Doris and uh, some others in the. Uh, in the room, thank you so Why much for your... stand up maybe uh, quickly? Yes, yes, please. No? Stand Stefan, up. Stand Alex, up. Holger, <laughs> Philip. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And thank you also to um, my, my dear friends from Ashoka for this beautiful work. I think uh, the seeds are here and we have to water it. Everybody in those abilities you have to make strong uh, um, uh, plants and strong uh, trees uh, out of it so that as many persons with disability have an advantage out of, of us in this room. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our distinguished panel speakers. I invite you uh, to find a seat. There are four seats here, a couple seats there. And by the way, I see some people still standing in the back. There are some free seats, a couple free seats uh, here in the front. Maybe people can just show where there's a free seat so that others can find. Feel free to come forward. There are seats remaining. Good. Great, okay, so now let's shift on to the next part of the program and the, the most exciting one. We're gonna hear these 11 innovations. They have very strict instructions. Um, they're allowed to present in four minutes each, which is a challenge. We know how passionate and excited we can get about our work. They have four minutes, not only to explain what they're doing, but even more to explain what their replication offer is and what their needs are. Um, and again, the invitation to you is really to try to listen actively, maybe even take some notes. Um, and after three, four presentations, I'll pause for three minutes and allow you some time to reflect on it and maybe note down some contacts, some ideas, some type of support that you might be able to offer to these projects or how you can also benefit from these projects and perhaps copy paste them in your local context with minor tweaks. Good. Let's get started. Um, and we're going to get started right away with Senate Debizi from... <laughs> Senate from Greta and Starks in Germany. Welcome. Hello everyone, it's really great to have you here. My name is Dibese, Senate Dibese, and my mission possible is inclusive cinema for 645 million persons with sight and hearing loss as easy as one, two, three with our app Greta. One, download the app. Two, go to cinema. Three, simply enjoy the film. Eight years ago, when I shot a documentary on the blind runner, Kedi, who was preparing for world championship, I realized she can do everything except enjoying cinema with her family and friends. It was the 21st century, man landed on the moon, but still there was no easy to use audio description and closed captions in cinema and not even in the US. That's why we developed our free app Greta, software-based solution, simply giving access with your own smart device. And it's on low cost for the cinema industry too. So people such as Kitty will never have to be stopped enjoying cinema again. We are very grateful to have strong partnerships with studios such as Universal, Disney, Fox, and of course, local film companies. Since the beginning in 2014, we were able to make a huge amount of films accessible in cinema. Approximately 100 films added each year. For the first time, 400,000 persons with sight or hearing loss, film fans with sight or hearing loss, were able to access cinema in German-speaking countries. That's what we are really passionate about. Films available are, uh, for instance, Fast and Furious, Star Wars, Avengers, and even Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> These films have English, French, and Spanish audio descriptions already. But what is the reason um, these films are not accessible in all Spanish-speaking countries, for instance? Actually, there is not, no, no reason. At least not anymore. We can serve all these countries to make these existing audio descriptions and, and closed captions accessible everywhere and even add in other languages. But the best impact is feedback we receive 
such as, I was touched to tears, experiencing cinema, how simple it is now, with my deaf son. And because this social business is successful and fun, we really want now to hand over the whole job and business opportunity to our users, to people with sight and hearing loss in new territories. Free up your power. You have the power with your associations to increase accessibility in cinema massively through this reliable and proven business model. Let us show you how to establish employment and inclusion in cinema as easy as one, two, three. One, say yes to this strong network to grow. Two, scale up in your country's inclusion worldwide. Three, start today. It's, everything is in place already. App, check. Platform, check. Collaboration with studios, check. Low entrance fee, check. It's not rocket science. It's only social franchise. We want to replicate in 10 countries this year. And we are looking for, uh, we, we are looking for partners. Please get in touch and may the first be with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senate from Greta and Starks. Next, Pedro Prata from Escola de Gente in Brazil. I start by speaking out of the microphone so that blind people know where I am here in the room. My name is Pedro Prata, and when I was 18, I participated at the first project of Escola de Gente. It was an encounter about inclusion and accessibility. It was transforming. I became a professional that can intervene whenever the right is violated, especially of persons with disabilities. Today, I coordinate this NGO and I have the opportunity to present to you this project. It has the potential to guarantee the equity between persons with and without disability. How? Transforming a generation of people to not discriminate. Companies and organizations seek young professionals that understand the diversity and inclusion with the depth that the contemporary world needs. But who trains this youth? No one. But young people have no support. They have to learn on their own about inclusion and accessibility. And no, this is not the way. Our project, Accessibility Promotion Agencies, faces this challenge. We develop a deep training program of 45 hours in seven modules. Inclusion and ethics of diversity, rights of persons with disability and decent work, accessible communication, audio description, accessible culture, physical accessibility, and sign language. Our uniqueness is that we offer total accessibility in communication, allowing youth with and without disabilities to experience together all the forms of human communication full accessibility in all the moments, even when there is no one with disability. Uh, it is a complete experience of how every communication should be that is accessible. We think and we work with all the disabilities. Everyone learns together not to discriminate. We trained 250 young people in, in low-income communities. According to the UN, 80% of persons with disabilities live in poverty countries like Brazil. Even in this context, we saw young people become professionals with a very high value type of knowledge and at the same time become leaders in their communities. For example, 
one of our agents is always called by the public hospital to interpret sign language for deaf, deaf patients, since there is no interpreter in the Brazilian health system. We work in, in low-income communities, but the discrimination between youth with and without disability happens everywhere. That's why it is now the time to bring this product to more young people. We have the content and the ability to replicate it anywhere in the world. If you have or if you want to be a foreman to bring it to your school, university, company, state institution, organization, or an online environment, we want to talk to you. Persons with disabilities have the right to participate everywhere. That is why it is fundamental that we create a generation capable to intervene whenever these rights are violated. Are you guys in? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pedro Prata from Escola de Gente. Next, we're inviting Sarah Minkara from Empowerment Through Integration in Lebanon and in the US. Hello, everyone. Yay. My name is Sara Mincara, and I'm the founder and CEO of Empowerment Through Integration. I am blind, and I'm proud of it. I lived a very full life, going to mainstream schooling, college, grad school, and I was even able to hike and slide down a volcano in Nicaragua. Amazing, right? But unfortunately, Growing up, I realized that most kids with disability are living a different reality. I lived a narrative of empowerment, value. I was seen as a human with potential. But most kids with disabilities are living a narrative of pity, charity, burden, shame. I can go on forever. Society puts out this narrative then it's embodied by the community, then by the families, by, then by the individuals with disabilities. And it becomes a vicious cycle of charity and disempowerment. And that's why I founded Empowerment Through Integration to tackle, disrupt, and change this narrative. To move from a charity narrative to a value base, where everyone believes that including people with disability is a value for all, across these different stakeholders. So the way we do that is very simple. We have designed human-centric programs where individuals are first empowered to recognize their bias surrounding disability and how that has allowed them to impose limitations on themselves and others, so people-centric. Two, then we empower them to notice gaps of systemic exclusion we use adaptive frameworks and not technical. Then we empower them to come up with creative, tailored solution of inclusion by equipping them with existing best practices and design thinking innovation tools. Finally, the power is in our hand to make a difference. So we take this approach and we've designed programs for youth family, and community at large. So far, we have served over 1,000 youth and family members and over 5,000 individuals through our intensive workshops. But now, we want to use our extensive 10 years of experience and field expertise to bring this forward. Because everyone, and I mean everyone, whether it's engineers, politicians, doctors, CEOs need to be part of changing and creating a new narrative. So the way we're doing that is we're not scaling our programs, we're not scaling our organization, we are scaling our approach. 
and we're creating an inclusive human-centered design training to bring forward to leaders across spaces. And the way we're going to be doing that is through, is through an executive education programs for executive and through customized in-house training for specific clients. Now, for this to become a reality, I would like every single one of you to be our inclusion partner. The way you can be that is, one, we are looking for funders who can be our co-branders to further develop this program. So international corporations, foundation, anyone. Two, we're looking for universities who would be interested in hosting these executive education programs. Three, we are looking for clients that are multi-regionals that would be interested in advancing inclusion in their own spaces. So if you're interested in learning more about this and being with us in this journey, please speak to me and my colleague Heather afterwards so you can be our inclusion partners. Thank you so much. Beautiful, powerful, and speechless. Um, next on stage will be Barbara Schuster from Kinderhände here in Austria. Welcome, Barbara. Hello, everybody. My name is Barbara Schuster. I co-founded Kinderhände in 2006. This is the only association in Austria which offers sign language courses and services for families with deaf children. I'm myself deaf and grew up in a hearing family where nobody could sign. So I know the lack of communication in these families. So what are the needs and why is our service necessary? Well, first, 95% of the deaf kids are born in hearing families. Language acquisition is not a given process in these families. There is no given common language which all can hear or see. And most parents and their children have no access to Austrian Sign Language, and thus children experience little or no language exposure. This leads to language deprivation. And hearing parents with deaf children may not get the relevant information about sign languages, deaf community and culture or identity, and therefore cannot make informed decisions regarding the future of these children. In the, the consequences are brutal language deprivation leads to academic, social and occupational difficulties and disadvantages. What we can offer these families are courses, workshops with hearing and deaf teams and learning material in Austrian Sign Language. We bring hearing and deaf families together to learn more from each other. We also counsel families and provide them with relevant information about deafness and created special curricula and training programs for educators to gain knowledge on sign languages and also visual learning. At Kinderhände we work and learn bilingually, that is children benefit from deaf adults as role models. In the pictures, you can see or gives you an impression on our bilingual learning situations at Kinderhände for children from six months to 14 years in our unique bilingual teaching setting with hearing and deaf trainers. And you can see learning, our learning materials that families can use at home. So what is the impact of our services? Well, our service reaches more than 300 kids a year who get access to Austrian Sign Language or start to learn it. Heavy language or not does make a difference. Access allows kids to develop linguistically age-adequate, 
This is of high importance for the entry in kindergarten and school. Our service empowers parents who get the skill to sign and the knowledge to deal with the deaf family members. And we also, um, 300 and 400 educators who join the Kinderhände program are well informed. And last but not least, we create new workplaces for deaf people as half of the team is deaf. And to stay significant in the lives of these families and have an impact in society, we need strategic partnerships. We are looking for partnership for sale points in Vienna and other federal states for our materials. We are looking for social investors and business angels who accompany us on the way to a barrier-free communication for bilingual families. We need network partners and policymakers who support families and their communicational needs. We need lobbying that affected parents have a choice to be pro-sign language and get the support they need. We need sponsorship who finance courses or new language our learning materials and donations for families who cannot afford our courses. We want deaf and hearing parents because every child should get the access to Austrian sign language from birth on. Every child should get the chance to acquire it as a first language, to develop a deaf identity and career. We are looking for you. And thank you for your attention. I would be happy to meet you after this session. Thank you very much to all four. So with this, we're closing the first round. There are still two rounds, but I'll just invite you to take two minutes now to pause, reflect, and fill in at least one support idea that you might be able to provide to one of these four projects. You have them on your engagement card again, which is on your desk, and you all have two cards in your welcome bags. So no excuse, I didn't find a card. You all have one. But, um, and you can find the organizations in the order of their presentation. So as a reminder, we had Greta and Starks, inclusive cinema app. We had Escola de Gente, training youth around accessibility and inclusion in low-income communities. We had Sarah Minkara, value-based and human-centric design approach and training for different stakeholders. And we just heard from Barbara uh, Kinderhende on training for um, deaf youth and their family. Two minutes. Feel free to exchange with your neighbor if, if, if it's preferable. Welcome Lee Ann Davis from the National Center for Criminal Justice and Disability in the US. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Ann Davis and I'm with the ARCS National Center on Criminal Justice in the US. I want to start by introducing you to a friend and a colleague of mine, James Metters. James has developmental disabilities, but he's also a rape survivor. James experienced sexual assault four different times over his life, and the last time was in his own apartment where he was raped by someone that he thought was a friend. Now, James and I share some similar experiences and that we are both sexual assault survivors, but he experienced the justice system very differently. And that's because the justice system is not set up or equipped to serve people with developmental disabilities. So the challenge that we see is how do we help people with disabilities really have access to the justice system? Here's what we know from data in the US. People with disability are two to three times more likely to be victimized. Now, when we look at the other side of the issue, they have a 43% chance of being arrested by age 28. We have to consider what are the root causes of this. We know that there's persistent bias, there's a lack of knowledge, and a lack of experience among criminal justice professionals many of whom have never had any training when it comes to disability. 
So here's the solution. We knew it had to be more than just training alone. So we began to think about how do we get the justice community talking to the disability community? So we have a three-step approach with our Pathways to Justice training initiative. Step one is creating disability response teams. These teams are made up of law enforcement, victim advocates, attorneys, people with disabilities, and disability advocates. And what they do is become the go-to resource on these issues in their community. Step two, we then work with the disability response team to provide training to justice professionals in their own communities. And then last, we provide technical assistance for these teams so that it doesn't end on training day. They can continue to learn and grow and learn from each other about solutions that work in their area. To date, we have uh, created 15 disability response teams. You'll see them there in orange um, on the map. And we've trained over 1,200 justice professionals. And while we've covered a lot of ground, we know we have so much more to, to go. And that is where you come in. Uh, we are looking to scale the full Pathways to Justice model, starting in the U.S., but we'd like to then go globally as well. We're using the licensing and the train-the-trainer approach. But I want to share with you the needs that we have, because I know that you're excited to join us in this. First, we're looking for partners. We need partners um, who kind of share our vision of justice for people with disabilities, we also are looking for funders, um, funders who can provide the uh, help to develop more capacity within our National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability so that that will allow us to get more and more training out to justice professionals. And then last, expertise. We're looking for expertise specifically in helping us replicate the model internationally, but then also an evaluation as we look at having a very strong tool so we can know that what we're doing works, not just in the U.S., but internationally as well. Now, James had a clear pathway to justice, but without that, he would have never been able to move from victim to survivor, and without building pathways to justice, people will never be able, people with disabilities, to have a way to experience inclusive justice. We thank you so much for your time today. We have brochures um, that we'd like to share with you on the Pathways to Justice training, and we hope that you will join us in being a partner with us for inclusive justice. Myself, Ariel Sims, is here as well. Please look for us later, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Leanne. Um, next, from Mexico, we have Mariana Lopez from Unidos Somos Iguales. Can you give it to Liliana, please? Thank you, Luik. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mariana, as Luik said. I'm excited to share with you who we are and how we work. Unidos Somos Iguales promotes social inclusion for people with disabilities. Our mission is to transform lives through the interaction of people with and without disabilities, with the real life changing experiences in order to achieve a society with more empathy, inclusion, and sensibility. Unidos gets two populations together that don't usually interact with each other. This is through programs that promote social inclusion, with activities such as going to social clubs, bowling, going to the movies, basically just having fun. It is, it is this interaction that raised the awareness. And also for, for fundraising, we give workshops and training sessions in schools and companies in a manner that is both experiential and fun. This project promotes awareness and sensitization to fight and reduce ignorance and lack of interaction. Above all, our most, our most important goal is, to the, is the respect of human rights. The essence of the model is that there must always be a person with a disability interacting side by side with a person without a disability. We, uh, at this time, is, this is how 
people realize what are the skills and virtues of people with disabilities, and at the same time, people without a disability discover their own skills, such as leadership, tolerance, empathy, openness, all kind of, all kind of skills. Those achieving a transformation and becoming promoters and agents of a social, social change in their environments. Throughout 32 years, yeah, we have managed to raise the awareness of the number of people behind me. And this is multiplied with the impact that young people who have participated in UNIDOS as volunteers under, undertake new social projects. Through our model, we can improve the quality of life of people with disability by making themselves more independent, raising their self-esteem, self-confidence, feeling, inclu feeling included in a society, accepted, and above all, making friends. Here's one of my favorite examples. Yeah, he's my friend Leo. He's 31 years old and he was born with a spina bifida. He got into needles when he was eight and he was a, an introverted child. He, his friends were his family. And now, after like more than 20 years, he's happy, he's full, he's completely developed into a great person and he just opened his own coffee shop and that's not even all. She met Leti at Unidos and they're getting married this October. Yeah, that's great. Well, coming back, we have uh, documented all our processes through manuals, which allows for choosing the idea what to replicate. That could be the whole program or just some parts of it. Of it. Yeah, and we have an online training course for potential replica replicators. We have our, our national structure that can sustain the replication and currently we are replicating in 17 cities around Mexico and Chile, and we are ready to expand further. So, we, if you are someone who works with people with disability, everybody, an organization who wants to work with young people to enable them as agents of change and disability advocates, we invite you to join forces with us. Also, if you are a company or consulting firm that helps us to improve our training capabilities, and organizational capabilities, or an organization that wants to support replicating the model. We are ready to replicate tomorrow. We have all. Are you ready? Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. We're going to travel to Botswana with Modesta Nirenda from Solar Ear. Good afternoon, everybody. Is it close enough? Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Modesta Nurenda, and I hail from Botswana, representing Solar Ear. There are 624 million people in the world with a hearing loss, and this is a diagnosed hearing loss. Every single person in this room is losing their hearing with age. Out of the 10 million hearing aids made annually, only 12% of these go to developing countries, where 66% are found. The average, the, the, the entry price of getting a hearing aid is $1,500. Solar Ear has reduced this to $100. Continued use of a hearing aid often exceeds the amount of income a family gets. It can go up to $300 over the lifetime of the hearing aid. Discontinued use of hearing aids or discontinued hearing results in exclusion from society, exclusion from, from meaningful participation in economic, social, political activity, any type of human interaction that develops the human being. What it essentially translates to is that with the current system, we are promising poverty to people who are losing their hearing every day, people who have lost their hearing already. This is our solution. It is a solar rechargeable hearing aid, charging up a battery, using what's already available on the market, no need to reinvent the wheel recharge your, your hearing aid directly 
or the hearing aid battery, and this costs $30. How does it assist us to, uh, to access affordable hearing? We don't need to replace the solar ear battery up to three years of its lifetime. So you can, you, you can have the same battery and recharge it up to three years without the replacement which is done weekly. It can be used in 80% of existing hearing aids today. And it does not rely on, on having access to electricity. You, it can be used using sun or ambient light. And it also promotes, at the same time as it's developing, best practice of minimizing the amount of zinc air batteries that we throw out. And we all know zinc air and metal are not biodegradable materials. In 10 years, we would like to see ourselves on every continent, since every continent has people who are losing their hearing. <laughs> of course, we want to work with partners. Who are the partners we dream of? like-minded organizations like ourselves who have the core value, who, with whom we share the core value of reducing uh, the cost of hearing. We're looking for strategic partners. These are already existing retail and commercial outlets through which hearing aids are dispensed and hearing aid batteries. We're also looking to continuously work with developmental organizations who work so hard to subsidize the cost of uh, hearing loss. And of course, policymakers and governments through whom many of us rely for our health care, our hearing health dispensation systems. Thank you very much for the short presentation. I hope to engage with you further. Thank you, Modesta Solar Ear. Um, we're traveling back to. Colombia now, with um, a duo presentation from Monica Cortes from AS Down, Colombia, and Natalia Acevedo from Pro Familia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalia Acevedo, and I am here representing Pro Familia, one of the four organizations that have joined forces to work around this project, My Sexuality, My Right. My Sexuality, My Right is a project that aims to raise awareness around the sexual and reproductive rights of people with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. This under the inspiration of Article 23 of the CRPD. But you may wonder, why is it important to talk about sexuality when there are other topics that we are worried about? Let's see, there are many stereotypes about the sexuality of people with disabilities. For some people, it's still hard to imagine someone with an intellectual disability falling in love, being a parent, or having sexual desire. For this reason, many women with disabilities are still being sterilized, not only in Colombia, but in many parts of the world. They suffer from higher rates of sexual violence and comprehensive sexual education or reproductive health services are not accessible or available. For this reason, we decided to join forces with these four basic stakeholders, people with disabilities in the center of this initiative, their families and caregivers, the health sector, and decision makers. Throughout the last six years, we have been working around these four strategies. First, we have empowered and train young leaders with disabilities around their sexual and reproductive rights. Now we have over 120 leaders in six cities of Colombia that are ready to talk and advocate for their rights. Second, we have worked really hard and we have created a comprehensive health model that allows people with disabilities to access sexual and reproductive health services respecting their confidentiality, their autonomy, and supporting their decision makers, the, their decisions in topics as important as contraception and consent. Now this model is working throughout the 33 clinics of Profamilia in Colombia. We have also advocated for change. And in 2017, we got the Minister of Health of Colombia to enact a resolution that explicitly prohibit any forced treatment on people with disabilities and also makes 
accommodations and consent mandatory for all health providers in the country. Finally, we have done some research and knowledge production. We have created segregated data and we are happy to share these reports with you at the end in our stand. Now I give the word to my colleague, Monica. Good morning, uh, excuse me, good afternoon. My name is Monica Cortez. I'm representing here uh, Family Voices. Um, and also we work with person with, uh, and also the work that we do with person with intellectual disabilities in this project, including my son Alejandro, who is my inspiration. Continue with our project presentation, uh, what do we want to replicate? We want to replicate a comprehensive model that includes strategies to impact all stakeholders that Natalia mentioned. How? Sharing uh, our knowledge and experience, share tools and provide technical assistance to different actors. Where we want to uh, scale up our practice in different regions of Colombia and in other countries of Latin America. Who are we looking for? We are looking partners that work on gender and disability rights health institutions that want to make services inclusive for all, families and people with disabilities that want to talk about sexuality and reproductive rights, and finally donors that want to invest in the replication and strengthening the, this practice. Now I want to leave you with this quote from 1992 by Anna Finger that represent the sense of our project. Natalia, please read. Sexuality is often the source of our deepest oppression. It is also often the source of our deepest pain. It's easier for us to talk about and formulate strategies for changing discrimination in employment, education, and housing than to talk about our exclusion from sexuality and reproduction. We hope you can join us in the defense of sexual and reproductive rights of people with disabilities. Thank you for the opportunity to share our experience in this important event. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much. Before we go to our three last interventions, I'll give you again a minute to reflect on what you've heard, on the four projects you've heard, as I try to, yeah. And note down any ideas you might have, contacts, expertise you could share, funding opportunities, anything that you believe might be relevant and useful for these projects. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go next to the US uh, and have Alito Alessi from Danceability International. Welcome, Alito. My name is Alito Alessi and I'm the founder of Danceability International. I'm honored to be here. First of all, thank all of you for coming. It's an amazing experience to stand here in front of you. They say like birds of a feather. So many people caring about the world together. And all of those people doing the same work that are not here. Thank you. Let's keep on. I grew up with three people with disabilities in my family. They were my mother, my sister, and my uncle. They were not disabled people. I never related to them as disabled people. So in a way, danceability found me. People are not disabled with all due respect to reality. People are people.
People with and without disabilities are separated and isolated from each other. When any person is isolated, then all of us are isolated. All of us are separated from each other. The arts have always been a tool for social change. People do not have equal access to artistic expression. Systematic expression and prejudice contributes to a hierarchy of access. Educators who are not trained to facilitate totally inclusive experiences perpetuate the problem. Danceability is the art of being together. Through dance and movement, inclusive communities worldwide experience the benefit of being together in physical activity and artistic expression. This changes the perception and experience of relationships between all people. Mutual learning facilitates an equal evolution of society. Danceability is a contemporary dance practice that promotes artistic expression and movement exploration between people with and without disabilities. We teach everybody the same information. The methodology changes depending on the present, depending on the population. How you teach depends on who your students are. We work simultaneously with all people in any combination of people. We work with the full spectrum of humanity. All means just what it says, all people. We have workshops and classes, performances, certification trainings, methodology, and manuals. I am the blue star. I am the only trainer of this work. I have trained over 600 certified teachers in 45 countries. Many of those people are people with disabilities. That is our problem. There are 21 master teachers one step away from becoming trainers. Our impact transfer model is to create a master trainer program. If we multiply the number of master trainers, we can do what took me 30 years in five years. We've created a master training certification program. Our goal is to move from an arts initiative to a social entrepreneurship with a business model based on franchising. This will include an affiliation model, professional guidelines, licensing, research, reporting, and curriculum. Our phase one pilot program will happen in Austria, Germany, Uruguay, and the United States. We do it in those places because we have master teachers, infrastructure, and history in those places already. We're looking for partners who want to foster the art of being together. We need mentoring and funding for a business model development, capacity building, and the pilot projects. <coughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Alito, Danceability. Um, next on stage from Israel will be Sally Ross Bihari from Enosh. Welcome, Sally. Are you using this? Yeah. I'll rise it up if I need it, thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Sally Ross Bihari. I'm the Director of Professional Excellence for ENOSH, the Israeli Mental Health Association. We are a nonprofit organization who provides community services and promotes the rights of people with psychosocial disabilities. This morning, Caroline Casey, we're talking about a conference of the heart. Mine 
is beating like crazy now. And I'm inviting yours to beat, me, to beat with mine. Four years ago, we decided to go on a life-changing journey. I'm, prou I'm very proud to present Seeds of Change, a training program on sexual trauma and psychosocial disability, breaking the double bind of silence. I want to start with a very strong number, 50%. 50% of women with psychosocial disabilities are victims of sexual assault. I want to share a little story, the story of Anat. Anat was 42 when I met her. She has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. She heard unbearable voices and no medication helped. It seemed like she was okay, but actually, she was just functioning. Till she met her counselor, herself a survivor of sexual assault, that started asking questions. Eventually, they both understand that the voices that Anat heard were not schizophrenia voices. They were reenactment of the trauma that she had suffered. And actually, she was living her trauma over and over again, and they understood why the medication didn't help. You cannot medicate trauma. We found that staff in mental health services are lacking the knowledge and the experience for, of sexual trauma, and they are looking for the right toolbox. So we created Seeds of Change. It's a modular training program for staff in the mental health services that provide a safe environment to explore their attitudes toward this double bind of silence. How does it work? It's a psychoeducational process on issues such as sexual assault, childhood abuse, healthy sexuality, and trauma-oriented recovery. When staff is trained through the lenses of sexual trauma, they become more aware of the inherent barriers of the system and the needs of the beneficiaries. It's a joint journey that both the staff and the beneficiaries are walking together. So what did we achieve in our solution? We see two levels of impact. One is professional and the other one is personal. What we see now is hundreds of staff members trained and thousands of people provided with trauma-informed care. On the personal level, where trauma-informed services is implemented, we see reduction in symptoms and decrease in hospitalization. We work towards continuity of services and partnerships with other professional organizations, all towards zero barriers. You can bring this change to your own organization. We offer training packages for all kinds of needs. We look for organizations waiting to replicate trauma-informed services. Come and join us. Join our journey by collaboration or by investing in our ongoing process. I'm inviting you all to come to see us in the impact transfer area. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. I'm going to need the clicker. Great, cool. Or, or rather, next, last but not least, please join me in welcoming Francesca Fedeli from Fight the Stroke in Italy. Welcome, Francesca. Ciao, I'm Francesca from uh, Italy, and I'm representing Fight the Stroke, who is a social enterprise advocating for young stroke survivors that actually uh, went through a disability that is called cerebral palsy. What I wanted to show you, if the slides uh, are going, is uh, why I got to know this history. So uh, me and my husband went through uh, this uh, cerebral palsy disability and discovered it for the first time because in 2011, when my son Mario was born, after 10 days we discovered that he got a stroke. 
At that time, we didn't know that even uh, kids, even unborn kids, could suffer a stroke, and uh, that this could lead them uh, to a diagnosis of uh, motor impairments, cognitive impairments, uh, and uh, behavioral problems. So, as you can imagine, we spent more than two years looking for solutions all around the world, but what we have found in terms of rehabilitation was just this kind of kids could uh, only attend uh, two hours per week of motor rehabilitation, and that's what they deserve. So we thought that uh, the motor rehabilitation at that time was not effective, was not designed around these uh, children, uh, and uh, overall it was not scientifically uh, evidence-based. So we came up with a solution that is not just a simple help or a simple piece of technology that could solve the problem of all of this family. We rethought about a new uh, inclusive design approach and uh, uh, rethought about a new ecosystem that we called Mirrorable. So we get in touch with our uh, parents, with our family, uh, through two main entry points. One are the Facebook closed groups, and the other uh, are the international and national uh, uh, center for pediatric stroke that we have newly established, for example, in, uh, in Italy, in, uh, in Genova. Uh, then these kids can go through an intensive home therapy program. It's based on mirror neurons, so very uh, evidence-based, uh, supported by the National uh, Research Center. And uh, just uh, uh, staying at home and having this kind of uh, rehabilitation that could improve uh, in terms of motor outcomes plus 26% compared to the traditional therapy. Then uh, uh, throughout all the year, they could go uh, a kind of a one or two intensive summer camps all together. And this is where we do apply our proprietary methodology, but also uh, where we can uh, match the kids uh, and also where uh, we can deliver them uh, almost uh, the same amount of hours of rehabilitation that they usually deserve during the year. So if we think of a world in which this is not uh, a rare disability, but it affects more than 17 millions of kids and family all around the world, uh, we have come out with, uh, with a solution. That's not a miracle, but uh, we know that if we can uh, uh, early detect uh, the, the type of uh, pathology that uh, uh, these kids have gone through and uh, we uh, help them and their family with intensive appropriate re rehab plan, uh, we could for sure have a, a better outcome in terms of better life of these families. So what we are doing right now, we have uh, done our homeworks, we have done our clinical trials in Italy, we have demonstrated that uh, this uh, program is uh, effective, uh, and we have uh, used whatever kind of technology uh, that could help us on deliver the product at global level. So even when thinking about development of the platform, we were already thinking globally and developing it in multiple languages. That's why we feel that now we are ready to expand our, our solution and uh, what we are looking for right now is just a, a partner that would like to be in this journey with us. So there could be private public hospitals, insurance companies, and power families. So families like, like us uh, went through this, uh, this issue, but uh, that they want to fight the stroke together with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So those were the 11 innovations, and I would invite all of you. They've been working very hard since six months to clarify the strategy, prepare the pitch, and now they just would love to connect, meet, have conversations with you, see how you can collaborate, how you can benefit from what they have tested and proven. Um, May I invite you all for a big round of applause for the projects and for Paola Reid, who has been helping me a lot over the last months as well.
so thank you very much. Um, we're closing the session now, uh, but we have 20 more minutes, so feel free to join or to meet the projects now or at our impact transfer desk right next door at the entrance of MM1 today, or join us tonight during the exhibition. All the projects will be there as well, and you can continue conversations, share ideas, and discover more. Thank you very much.